Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you. I am Rich Lyons, Dean of the Haas School here, and it is uh, my pleasure to welcome all of you to this Dean Speaker Series. It is co-hosted with our Haas School Institute for Business and Social Impact, and also our Department of Political Science here at UC Berkeley, this, this particular session. Let me start by extending a special welcome and thanks uh, to our friend of the school, Ambassador Frank Baxter. He's a former US ambassador to Uruguay, Chairman Emeritus of Jeffries, got his bachelor's in economics here in 1961 at Berkeley, also a UC Berkeley Foundation trustee. Uh, he has been uh, terrifically helpful on so many fronts and also in bringing uh, Jonathan Hite here to, to campus today. So Frank, I wanna, I wanna thank you. So today we're discussing uh, a topic of interest to all of us deeply. Capitalism, uh, morality, how do, we, how do we get capitalism even more right over time? These are the fundamental questions that our speaker has already contributed so much to in his writings and in his words. Uh, many question that these two terms, capitalism and morality, can live side by side, hand in hand. On the other side, uh, capitalism uh, is is sometimes seen as, as fundamentally exploitative, as negative. Uh, um, for, for many others, of course, it is a source, the fundamental source of liberation and prosperity and, and innovation. So uh, reality is never quite so dichotomized as, as it is often made out to be. And, and, and these two concepts, of course, do not have to be at odds with one another. Our invited speaker here, Jonathan Haidt, is currently writing a book which uh, explores this polarization. He introduces uh, a third story, another narrative, in the hopes to depolarize capitalism. And the story encourages a stakeholder view of business relationships. When this view is widely embraced, Jonathan argues that the, the exploitation a hypothesis or story uh, becomes less relevant or even irrelevant. We're fortunate today to have three experts, in fact, on the topic. Uh, Jonathan is our, our headliner. We also have uh, two terrific members of our, of our uh, internal community that I, will, that I will introduce. All of them really have built uh, their relationships or their reputations even in, in questioning the status quo and in pushing the business world to push beyond themselves. Uh, it's, my, it's my pleasure to introduce all three. So let me start with, with Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan is a social psychologist at NYU Stern School of Business. He received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, spent most of his career at the University of Virginia. Uh, his research examines the intuitive foundations of morality, how morality varies across cultures, including the cultures of different political perspectives. He's the author of many books, uh, New York Times Best Seller, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, and, and many other great books. Robert Strand will be on the, on the, on the dais as well today after we get the introductory comments from, from Jonathan. He is the executive director of our Center for Responsible Business, as most of you know. He's a faculty member here at Haas and associate professor uh, with the Copenhagen Business School. He's, he's currently writing a book on sustainable Vikings, in which he explores the stakeholder approach to capitalism in the Nordic region. Laura Tyson, you most all of you are familiar with, distinguished professor of the graduate school, also faculty director of our Institute for Business and Social Impact here at Berkeley Haas. She chairs the Blum Center for Developing Economies Board of Trustees. Previously, she served in the Clinton administration as the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and also as director of, I think, the first NEC, the National Economic uh, Council of the United States. Uh, thank you, and please join me in welcoming Jonathan to the stage. Thank you, John. Thank you. OK. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, so um, it's a, a very exciting time to be studying capitalism and morality. It's been interesting for, for many years, and suddenly, uh, politics makes it a lot more interesting. So I had to stick that on to extend my title last night, and I realized we're talking a lot about this. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Dean Lyons, for that, for that introduction. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Baxter, uh, for, for uh, making my visit possible. I had a wonderful visit yesterday in the political science department, um, and now I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. Just the conversation we had in the green room about all these trends uh, in which 
political developments are affecting business and especially leadership in this very polarized time. Uh, we had a, just a wonderful discussion in the 20 minutes we had before, and that's going to be where we start here and then invite you all to, to join. <clears throat> so let's get started. Um, I am in the Business and Society program at Stern. And <clears throat> if you just look at our web page, um, so it's a, there's a lot of black on it because we're in New York City and we just like to dress in dark, you know, <laughs> colors. And if you look at what we say our purpose is, now our purpose is so generic as to be basically pointless and meaningless. We, are, <laughs> we describe our program within Stern as an interdisciplinary endeavor. It prepares and supports business leaders in creating value for shareholders. To, it says nothing, really. Um, uh, but, now you're, but now you here, OK, you know, it's like, if you just look at this building. It's like light, airy, OK? <laughs> so Berkeley is like light and airy and progressive. Because if you look at how you describe yourselves, well, just the Center for Responsible Business, OK, that's not a partisan word, but we all know what it means. <laughs> and, if, and if you look at what you say about yourselves, you describe yourselves as equitable, inclusive, sustainable, sustainable finance, investment, human rights, business, sustainable this, sustainable Vikings, OK? This <laughs> screams, right? So your website clearly broadcasts, we are left of center, business scholars. Uh, let me just check on that. OK. So actually, let me see. Let's see who's in this room. Now, this is mostly, it looks like it's mostly MBA students here, I think. Um, but I just want to, um, but you've chosen to come to a, a, a talk here on, on this topic. So if, I, if you have to pick one of these four categories to describe your personal political orientation or views, what are they? OK, and I'm just going to call it out. You raise your hand. So raise your hand if you are. <laughs> Okay, and if you're, okay, yeah. Oh, actually, you know, you know what? Wait, can we do? No, we have so many MBA students. Well, no, we, actually, we should. Yes, we should close our eyes. We should actually. For a few years ago, it would have been not as, been as dangerous, but some people might want a, a position in government someday, and so yeah. Okay, so please, so I will, I will report the, I will report the averages. Okay, so seriously, everybody, close your eyes and get ready to raise your hand. Don't look around. That would really be cheating. OK, so raise your hand if you'd say you're on the left, liberal or Democrat. Raise your hand high. OK, looks like we don't need to call any other options. No, never mind. OK, that's what, OK, no, no, we do, we do. OK, keep your eyes closed, keep your eyes closed. OK, what if you were, how many of you say you're B, moderate or centrist? Raise your hand high. OK, uh, how about C, right or conservative? Raise your hand high. Higher, please. OK, uh, and then the last option is libertarian or classical liberal. Raise your hand high. OK, so I'll have to do it in reverse order. That's, so let me, you can open your eyes now. So what we had was we had, there were six people who said they, if they were libertarian or classical liberal. There were three. Three in this room said this. Um, uh, this was by far the largest, but this was about, half, about a third to a half as much. So the majority here are the, a substantial majority are this. What, who, who isn't on the left is moderate, and then there's just a couple of people there. Um, now, that is typically what you find in the rest of the university. That is clearly to the left of a business school, because a business school tends to have more, some more libertarians and conservatives. My point is just that what we are all doing here, and I should point out, what we do at, at my department in Stern is exactly the same issues. It's not that we're not on the left. We just don't advertise it as much as you do. Um, <laughs> so. And this is not a criticism, but it is a caution that if you're looking at difficult issues in which your own political views are going to shape what you see and what you think needs to be done, that means that as a scholarly enterprise, you're going to get it systematically wrong unless you seek out some critical or opposing views. That's why I wanted to start off with this demonstration. OK. Um, so <clears throat> let me briefly tell you my story as to how I ended up um, studying this stuff, uh, as, as Dean Lyon said, I was at the University of Virginia. I was, I'm a social psychologist. I knew nothing about business. I had no particular interest in it even. Um, I really just wanted to be in New York City because when my second child was going to be born and I was not really finishing my book, The Righteous Mind, I just said, oh my god, if I don't get this book out by the 2012 election, I, you know, I, I, I'm crazy. I need to just throw everything overboard. And I said, honey, we're moving to New York if I can raise the money to live there. Because uh, you know, and then I, uh, you know, I can promote the book from New York. So I just committed to going to New York, and I said, well, "How can I do that?" Well, I gave a talk at Stern. Maybe I'll call them up. 
Maybe, maybe I can teach business ethics for a year or something. And so, the, so Bruce Buchanan, the head of my area, said, yes, come on up. We'd love to have you. So I moved up in uh, July of 2011. And I, I taught a course with, uh, with Buchanan on business ethics and professional responsibility. And uh, I would, you know, I'd read the newspaper, and I, and I actually started reading the business section and the Wall Street Journal and all these you know, you know, business uh, things. And what you find is that, at least in the New York Times, you find a lot of coverage of the bad deeds of businesses. Not as much in the Wall Street Journal, but the New York Times, on this particular day uh, when I was teaching this course, I cut out, I brought a, like every story. Every story was about businesses behaving badly. And one below the fold, trial of a bond manager. But it was all like, look, students, the things we're learning about, fiduciary duty, conflict of interest. This is everyday stuff in the business world. Look, look, look. And look what else, look what this day was, Saturday, September 17th. What else was happening on Saturday, September 17th? You wouldn't know this. It's not coded in public memory. But one mile south of our classroom, Occupy Wall Street was breaking out at that moment, that day. And the whole point of Occupy was business sucks. Business is terrible. Business is exploitation. They quickly spread to London, to Paris. Even as Occupy itself faded out, the issues it raised of inequality became the major issues, or among the major issues for the next several years, certainly. They still are certainly with us. Uh, and with some very eloquent spokespeople um, yeah, uh, taking this view that capitalism is broken, uh, the most vivid image we get from those days, I think, is from an essay by Matt Taibbi in Rolling Stone where he said, Goldman Sachs, but we could just substitute capitalism, is like a giant vampire squid with its tentacles wrapped around the head of humanity, stuffing its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Okay, so the giant vampire squid is the image of this first story of capitalism, that capitalism is exploitation. Meanwhile, as I'm learning all of this stuff about how terrible business is, and you know, I'm new here, I'm 47 years old, I know nothing about capitalism. Uh, meanwhile, I'm surrounded by people who are saying that at Stern, we develop people and ideas that transform the challenges, da da da, to create value, da da, create value. Everybody's talking about creating value. And I'm pretending to be an anthropologist studying this business school because I'm only there for a year and I'm going back to UVA. Um, creating value, that's all they talk about, creating value. It's just a buzzword. Um, and then I, I get this uh, series of lectures because Jerry Mueller is a great intellectual historian. And I saw he had these lectures, so I bought them. And they're wonderful, wonderful lectures. I, I highly recommend them to you. But over and over again, I was learning about the history of capitalism and how it transformed the Western world in ways that, generally speaking, progressives would love. Uh, how capitalism, uh, so when Voltaire goes to the London Stock Exchange, he says, here, Jew, Mohammedan, and Christian deal with each other as though they were all of the same faith and only apply the word infidel to people who go bankrupt, <laughs> okay? So capitalism is powerful stuff at breaking down tribal barriers and promoting exchange among people. That's great. And then I saw this graph, which you know, we've all seen versions of it before. You'll see it in a, in a second. This graph shows GDP per capita from the year zero through the present, broken up. You, you can't see it yet. It'll rise. Right now, it's down so low that you can't even see it. GDP per capita in the year you know, one and through 1,000 through um, well, here, I'll have to move this chair so you can see what's going on. Um, so this is everybody on Earth was living on the equivalent of about $1.50 a day from, you know, the, from the year zero. Now, 1,500, you, you can barely see this, but there's a giant spike. There's a giant rise up in the blue line. And what that is, that's Western Europe. Now, why did Western Europe suddenly get so much richer around 1,500? Because mercantile capitalism. Okay? They weren't making things. Nobody really knew how to make stuff. But they knew how to move stuff. And they developed not just ships. Well, sure, they had ships, but the Chinese had ships. They also had the beginnings of corporate law um, and banking. And if you have those three, ships, corporate law, and banking, now merchants can pool their money and risk and send a boat to Indonesia and bring back spices. And a boatload of spices is not worth that much in Indonesia. But just by moving it to London, you've increased its value a million, I mean, I don't know how many, thousands and thousands of times. So there's more value in the world just by moving stuff. And this sets up, this jump here, sets up 500 years of European dominance of the planet because of that innovation in capitalism. All right, so the Europeans are dominant, dominant, dominant. And then our next, the next chapter of our story is, of course, this, the Industrial Revolution. And now here, the green bar is actually the United States, because even though, of course, Western Europe invented, you know, uh, Holland and, uh, or Britain especially, I'm sorry, Britain starts it off, 
uh, but the United States really masters it, and we've got all the natural resources and, and, a, and a, a good uh, um, you know, legal re uh, regimen for it. So this sets up 50 years of American dominance of the planet. Um, our, well, um, uh, the, the fact that the United States is so, do is, is so effective at, in, at uh, industrial capitalism. Um, but I like to show it this way. Well, okay, you can have to move this chair too. This is just up to 19, this is just up to 1950, okay? What is so amazing is, is that if you look at what happened between 1800 and 1950, it's like nothing compared to what happens in the next 50 years. The post-war world generated so much value, it just blows away everything that happened in human history. And of course, then Japan becomes the first non-Western nation to master the craft. They jump right into the game in just a few decades. Uh, and this data set from Angus Thompson stops. Uh, he, uh, he passed away. I haven't seen an update of this. But obviously, China in 2001, I mean, obviously, China is going to be up here now. So, so the whole world is changing because of capitalism. And here I am, a social psychologist from UVA, moved to New York, no particular interest in business, and I'm reading about all this stuff, and I'm like, oh my god, how did I not know this? How did I not understand that capitalism made our world? And I was thinking back on how in college I read Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene, and it was like, oh my god, evolution made the natural world. I understand it now. And this is like, you know, so anyway, I'm just sharing with you my enlightenment experiences <laughs> from my first few months at Stern, OK? But it's not just that you're just generating all this value and then the rich are soaking it all up, it's that poverty plummets. You've all seen these stats. So in, in 1820, 95% of people on this planet were living at basically starvation levels, you know, a dollar or two a day. And it drops gradually, especially, this is mostly Europe uh, and America um, getting wealthier. In 1960, it's still up this high. Um, it's basically as Asia and especially China come online and enter the market economy, generate so much wealth that poverty plummets 21% in the year 2010 and most, not most, oh. and for the first time in human history by 2015, for the first time in human history, less than 10% of people were living in extreme poverty. So again, this is just a stunning, this is, this is possibly the, the biggest moral positive in human history. And it's due not to charities, not to governments directly, but to the generation of wealth by businesses. That's what created all that value that has not quite ended, but is on the way to ending global poverty. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and it's not just that people get richer, they also get happier. Uh, this is a plot of how happy people are around the world. And while there are six factors that they find that go into it, the number one factor is, is actually GDP per capita is the most biggest of, of the six major factors. And so putting this all together, um, a corresponding view, if you don't like the, the, the um, giant vampire squid, uh, I think Scrooge McDuck or whatever that character's name is, uh, capitalism, it just works. Um, <laughs> Uh, is the corresponding other image. So if we put these two together, these are the two stories about capitalism that I was hearing over and over again in my first year at Stern in 2011-2012. And um, so as I was thinking about this, and I, you know, as, a, as someone who studies moral psychology, I thought, oh, well, if I can sort of illuminate the narratives about what each side thinks, like show so that each side can understand the other. Like, why do you think, why don't we see eye to eye on this? Why do you see something totally different from me? Um, and while I was working on that, I read this amazing article uh, in the journal, uh, Breakthrough, Breakthrough Journal, it's called. It's by these two guys. I think they're out here. In fact, one of them is running for Congress, I think, or governor or something. Schellenberger, he's running for something, right? Anyone know? Really interesting guy. Um, I, sh I should have looked that up for you. Anyway, uh, Ted Nordhaus and Michael Schellenberger wrote this wonderful article called Wicked Polarization. I highly recommend it to you. Um, I'll summarize it for you very briefly. It's one of the most powerful concepts I've ever encountered, and it goes like this. They draw on uh, the work of some planning professors, actually here at UC Berkeley in the 70s, and uh, Riddle and Weber contrasted what they called tame problems versus wicked problems. Now, a wicked problem is not just a really bad or serious problem. It's not that. A, a tame problem is one that just sits there and lets you solve it. And so cholera killed millions of people in the 19th century. But it was sort of an engineering problem. And people worked on it and made progress. And once they got you know, uh, fresh water lines and, and toilets and sewage lines, problem solved. It was a very tame, pro giant problem, but a tame one. It didn't change as they were studying it. But in contrast, poverty, as Riddle and Weber pointed out, is very, very different. It's not, it doesn't just sit there and let you work on it. Rather, people come to it with such strong preconceived notions about what it is and who's at fault. And what we need, what, here's the policy that we want to do. And gosh darn it, we're going to make sure that our, pre our preferred policy is actually the answer to this problem. We're committed to that. So when our politics commits us to certain things, we can't see straight. 
And that's the difficulty with solving problems like poverty. They are wicked problems. They reach into our heads and <coughs> warp things that we can't solve the problem. Um, and here's a great quote from the article. They say, experts could only define wicked problems in relationship to background solutions, which are themselves shaped by underlying values and a vision of the good society. And that's why this is so important for this group. If you are devoted to studying a vision, if you're, you have a vision of a good society and the role business plays in it, this is not a tame problem where you're gonna prove it. You are bringing that to the table. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but it means that it is largely in your head and you have to understand that as you're studying it. And one implication of this is that, as they say, as a result, disagreements over social and environmental policy cannot be resolved by experts, who in many ways make them more intractable. The more studies we get by think tanks and organizations on the right and on the left, the further we get away from solutions, because each side now has its studies that, con that conflict. So, um, almost everything that we're interested in these days is a wicked problem, just a, a few lists, and I could have put uh, all the ones from your website here. I just put sustainable food. Um, and uh, so if you're with me on this, that we are bringing, we are structuring problems based on our shared understandings with our political team. So now you can appreciate one of my favorite quotes from the social sciences. Um, it's from Clifford Geertz, but he's actually quoting Max Weber when, in, this, in this line. Uh, as, as Geertz paraphrases Weber, he says, man is an animal suspended in webs of significance that he himself has spun. Very useful line for thinking about the social sciences. And it's also, it really also maps onto the movie The Matrix, right? A lot of you have seen one of those movies. The, you know, what's The Matrix? The Matrix is a consensual hallucination. Together we create a, networks of me, a network of meanings and then we live in that network. And from within our network, we can see how evil the other people are and how, how, how they don't have any facts on their side. We've got all the facts. What's wrong with them? And of course, they think the same about us. So I saw my, my task, the thing I could do as a psychologist, is to sort of make clear these moral matrices. What is the, call it a moral matrix, call it a narrative through the matrix, whatever. That's what I'm going to show you now. So I used to just have a PowerPoint talk that I try to show it, but I, I found some great video people to basically turn these PowerPoint talks into 90-second videos. So I'm going to show you two 90-second videos. And let me point out to you, I, I made these videos. I, I, I wrote out a set of slots and a script. And then I, they each have this. So you'll see the videos have exactly the same structure at pretty much the same second point. They just swap content. But they have the same structure, you'll see. OK, let's go. OK, here we are. Once upon a time, work was real and authentic. Farmers raised crops, and craftsmen made goods with their own hands. But then, capitalism was invented, and darkness spread across the land as the smokestacks of the Industrial Revolution covered everything in soot. The capitalists became ever more skilled at extracting productivity from workers and pocketing the gains from their labor. The workers eventually fought back by unionizing. In the early 20th century, as the brutality and stupidity of capitalism were exposed, many governments granted workers some protection from the predators. Democratic welfare states were born. But the capitalists and their right-wing cronies were unrelenting. And in many countries, they have destroyed the unions, slashed regulations, and given the corporations free reign to exploit at will. So the rich get richer, the rest of us get poorer, our democracy gets weaker, and the planet gets hotter. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight against global capitalism and the super predators it has unleashed upon us. Okay, so just think, what, does that resonate with you? Does that seem like it captures some real truth about business and capitalism and society? Okay, now let's watch the second one and I'll ask the same question. Once upon a time, almost everyone was a peasant, a serf, or a slave. Kings and feudal lords took most of what people produced, so nobody had much reason to work hard. But then, in the 17th century, capitalism was invented, and the liberation began. In England, Holland, and America, they discovered that when you give people property rights, the rule of law, and free markets, you turn on a switch in their hearts. People want to work when they can keep the fruits of their labor. They want to invent new products, provide for their children, and be useful to others. 
Free market capitalism enables them to do these things. In the 20th century, some countries embraced communism and centralized planning, always with the same result. Shortages of everything, including food and freedom. But countries that embraced capitalism have grown prosperous in a single generation. Yet, despite the evidence of history, the left-wing egalitarians are unrelenting. And whenever they get control of a government, their first target is economic freedom. The egalitarians don't want to live in a world in which people who create more value for others get to enjoy more wealth for themselves. They'd rather that everyone be equal and equally poor. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight to protect capitalism and to extend its blessings to all of humankind. So, okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So let's just let's just do a vote by show of hands. Here you can keep your eyes open. Which one, if you, you know, well, if which one just felt more true? Obviously, they're metaphors, they're cartoons, they're caricatures. But which one felt like it's more true? Raise your hand if it was the first one, the exploitation one. Raise your hand high. Okay, and raise your hand if it was the second one, the liberation one. Okay, so in a business school, this is typically what I find. But in outside of a business school, it would be more the if it's in the other parts of the university, it's more. It is more generally the first. Um, okay. Um, and I should, I should point out, in our discussion beforehand, uh, Dean Lyons told me that when he speaks at graduation, can I, I go ahead, when he speaks at graduation, and, he, and he's called up to introduce the, the, you know, that he's called the dean for the business school, there's a sort of a, a bunch of snakes loose in the audience, like there's a, yeah, there's a hissing sound, there's a hissing sound, because Berkeley students think that Haas is a bad thing or bad place, or I should just say business is bad, business is bad is what they think, and because, you know, in most of the university, outside the natural sciences, that first story is what they, is what they generally share. So I'll close up in just a second. I just want to draw out some implications of this that I hope will guide our discussions. And, and I hope this will be useful for you as you read the newspapers, you talk with your friends. Why don't we see eye to eye on this? And I think the answer is this. If you endorse that first story as your implicit narrative of human history and what capitalism and business are, then you're going to constantly be worried about market failures. The left tends to think that markers are fra markets are fragile things. They're easily corrupted. There are lots of market failures. Well, if there are all these market failures, then we need the government. The government is our hero. It's our protector. That was certainly the case in the progressive era. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the government needs to hold back the capitalist predators. Uh, government, therefore, is, but government, on the other hand, is subject to capture by business and the rich. And so a lot of the legislative priorities of the left are to strengthen government's ability to control, tax, regulate, limit. Um, and therefore, the left wants more regulation, more fines and jail terms for business people, and more campaign finance reform to give them less influence. So it's, it's a consistent set of legislative and moral priorities if that's the view you hold of business. Conversely, if you hold the other view, if you hold story two, then you're constantly worried about government failures. Business is generally a good thing. It's government that screws everything up. Government is, in fact, the villain of the story. This was more true under, uh, uh, you know, in the last 30 years before Trump, but certainly from Ronald Reagan through George W. Bush, um, that was the story. Uh, government is the villain holding back innovation and growth. Government is subject to capture by your competitors. So the more we can shrink government and just have an open, open field of competition, the better things will be. Therefore, libertarians in particular want smaller government, less regulation, and less prosecution. So those, I think, are the two stories. So if those are the two stories, two very incompatible views of, of what we're up to, of what we need to do, do we need a third story? I think that the answer is, is yes. Uh, Dean Lyons said that in my book, I'm telling the thirds. I don't actually know what it is yet, but I, I'm, I hope that we'll figure it out today so I can. Um, no, it's, I mean, I have some ideas. And, it, and, and but, yeah, he's, yeah, he's okay, he's good, okay, yeah, you, you write it. I'm busy, you write it. Um, do we need to, th I think the answer is yes. And actually, that's, I think, what we're really engaged in. Um, because, you know, even though I sort of, you know, teased about how you're clearly progressive, um, what's interesting about a place, a place like Haas, and, and really most of the top business schools, is that even though almost everybody's on the left, they don't buy that first story. They know that business is not evil. Business can do really bad things, but business on the whole is a force for good, and how do we make it more a force for good? I think that's what we're all up to. Certainly, that, that's what we're up to. That's what you're up to, I think. So, um, uh, actually, so that's it. That's my introduction. Let's, let's keep talking.
So I'm going to serve, uh, I'm Laura Tyson, I'm going to serve more or less as the moderator here. I might occasionally say something, but I really, this has been a, so fascinating and we had a fascinating discussion behind the scenes. So maybe I'll go right to the fascinating part of that discussion, which was a continuation of this. And in thinking about this third, the, 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 the solution or, 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 the, or the third version of capitalism, one thing I know you're thinking about is the fact that those two stories are actually very U.S. stories yeah. in a way. And U.K. They actually work okay. very well in the U.K. U.S. and U.K. There are different forms yeah. of capitalism. You are actually <clears throat> using capitalism for China, which I would use too, but I think that's yeah, it's, uh, it's controversial. Um, but uh, let's take the, the, uh, the, the Nordic Vikings. Let's take the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the forms of capitalism which are trying to kind of take the edge off of some of the problems, yeah. but trying to encourage the innovation anyway. So I don't know, I'd like both of you maybe to Absolutely. say a little yeah, bit I'll about no. that. Let me just start, I'll throw it to you very quickly. Because the simple, so what I did when I conceived the idea for this book and then I got the advance, um, is I just said, okay, I'll take my family around the world, we'll visit all kinds of places, and I'll write it off as a tax expense because it's research. It's research. So we spent some time, uh, spent some Good time in Asia. Good family man. Good family man. <laughs> 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 uh, so we, we spent some time in Asia, we spent a few weeks in Scandinavia, uh, and the formulation I came up with while traveling was, well, first of all, I would interview people about what they like and don't like about business in their country, and what became clear is that um, everybody, or no, well, on average, people most admire Scandinavian capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, this, after, in the wake of the financial crisis and collapse, very few people said, oh, we want American style. So Scandinavian capitalism is widely respected around the world. A lot of people who know anything about different forms want that. And I think the simplest way of saying what its superiority is is this. Um, every society has to balance competing needs for dynamism and decency. And Anglo-American capitalism has thrown its lot in with dynamism. Mm -hmm. um, we are the most dynamic forms in the US and the UK. We generate the most innovation. Um, and we sort of left the, the, the decency, well, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Whereas, let's take the opposite case to say France. There are other mm -hmm. places like France that have thrown their lot in with decency. They're very undynamic. Um, they have a lot of protections for workers, therefore people don't want to hire. Um, so France is an example, and Japan, I think, suffers from some of the same. Um, so there are forms that uh, clearly, so clearly, if you go all the way one way or the other, mm -hmm. you've got problems. And the two are a little bit inversely correlated. But they're not at all perfectly inversely no. correlated. And that's what's so great about Scandinavian capitalism, is that they have done probably the best job in the world on the decency front, and a very good job, I'd say, on the dynamism front, so good that part of their decency allows people to take risks. Whereas in America, people are afraid to start a business yeah. because I'll lose my health insurance if I quit my job. So the Scandinavians have been able, mm -hmm. so that's my simplistic, that's like, yep. okay, you, but now please add to that. Is that <laughs> well, you, you nailed it. And I'll, I'll just have to say, I told my colleague, uh, Saren, before, if I'm just sitting up here and I can't talk because I just have a big smile on my face, <laughs> it's because this is, Jonathan, your work is so invigorating. And now here we're marrying all the Nordic stuff to it. So <laughs> I'm really going to, Saren, you are going to have to come up here and, and slap me pretty quickly. I'm so excited about this. Um, um, and I think that the, the, the point here, I, I not, let me draw from, you're a self-professed libertarian, as no, I, not. no, Wait, well, people that's how no. I understand it. No. Well, I'm let's, the, I'm the central, he, let, he let's, didn't raise his let's hand. Let's say, he no, did, he didn't that's raise true, his hand. you're we the one, well, maybe you shouldn't close your eyes and you have okay, to vote now, yeah. if we all did this. No, I'm a, mo I'm a, I'm not on any team, and if anything, I'm a moderate. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> let's say, hypothetically, there are libertarians out there. There's three of them, yeah. And there are three of them in this room here, and, six, and they're good. Six, there's six, six of them. Six, yeah. very good. There are a lot of them yeah. in the valley, so. This is yeah. something, I think it gets to this narrative about capitalism, because as my friends in the Nordic region, and as... I walk around with your book and this other book, The Nordic Theory of oh, Everything. Yeah. And they talk about the theory of Nordic love. And the theory of Nordic love is that in order to truly love something, you have to have autonomy. So you're choosing it. Okay. And this is how public policy in the Nordic region is, uh -huh. is let's ensure that people can actually be autonomous. They aren't slaves of massive debt here. They're not slaves to their I employer see. because of insurance okay. and things like this. Uh -huh. And so this area of autonomy, I think, is so important. The American narrative of the Nordic region, when we talk about capitalism and left and right, we don't talk about that at all. We talk about big government and lots of taxes on, on you know, people on the right. Would, I think they're socialists. Exactly. We, we conflate this idea of socialism and, and capitalism. 
And that is, for, for my money, with all its flaws, the Nordic region, though, when you talk about a third story of capitalism, I think it can help to offer at least some ideals that we can point toward. Yeah, no, th th that's great. So, uh, you know, we totally agree on this. Now, the question, though, that I'm sure you get, and that Bernie Sanders would get, and everybody else would get on this, is, yeah, that's great if you've got a small, homogeneous yes, country with no crime and everyone can trust each other. And if we have a safety net, people won't exploit it. But hey, America's really different and we can't do that. Yeah. What do you say to that, Robert? Well, what I'd say, and this is where I, I draw from, <laughs> this is great. This is, I, and this is where I, I would draw from, I don't know if that's a softball. I think that's kind of a medium pitch okay. there. Uh, but to draw from, from the business school, you know, when we, when we want to learn about something, we use benchmarking. And so if I want to learn about lean manufacturing, independent of what industry I might be in or where I'm in the world, I want to look to Toyota. I want to learn about that. So because of their performance. And I treat the same with the Nordic region as we can benchmark this place, mm -hmm. but we always know that if I'm in the pharmaceutical industry, I'm going to have to make some adaptations to this stuff than what I could if I was in the automotive industry. So there may be some things that I can draw inspiration from. Um, and I'd put it down to then, they made decisions, they made policy decisions there that don't just naturally bubble up. There were some painstaking decisions to make there. So I think there's something that we can learn, but clearly every context is different, and we need to adapt. OK, then I would add to my list of differences. They have a functioning policy process where if there's a problem facing the country, the political leaders get together, study it, <laughs> and by a process of sort of give and take and mutual discussion, they actually address it. That's all the time we have. Yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. So since that's unlikely to happen in the next 10 or 20 years in this country, so, is, is there a way that we can adapt to a broken political process? So, or can you only do Scandinavian if you've got effective, active government? So I, 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 would, I, I get these questions all the time, too, that you just posed to Robert. So on my answer of the size of country, I actually think we should be paying a lot of attention to Germany. And that's what I'm doing mm. now, because Germany is a big, complicated, yeah. powerful economy. And it is doing a number of the things that the Nordics do. Mm. Uh, they're actually learning from the Nordics and actually copying what they do in a very different, more diverse side. That's number one. So I think scale matters. And I do think we should be paying attention to a scaled version of this. Uh, on uh, the issue of can we learn anything because of trust, because of the lack of a political process mm -hmm. here, I, I actually think uh, right now I've been focusing on what states are doing. Because at the level yeah. of states in the United States, for, for, take for yeah. example, there's a massive, now 30 governors in the United States have signed on to something called re Rework, which is really a whole kind of job training educational system. And actually it started in Colorado paying attention, in this case, not to the Nordics, but to the Swiss apprenticeship model. Okay, yeah. okay so, yeah. so maybe there are pieces. That, that, that's Robert's. Let's, let's take a little part of what they do. A lot of people around the world who are reforming their child care policies look to the Nordics. Because one of the things we now know is if you're going to get a family to take advantage of, 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 of maternity leave, you also have to make them pay attention to paternity leave. Because otherwise, the fathers won't take off from work, and the mothers fall behind. Mm -hmm. Uh, in work. So basically we kind of, oh, well, we see all this from the Nordics. Let's do that. So I, d I do think we can do some, some benchmarking no, on policies. That's great. I've not heard that before. That's yeah. a very no, helpful no. step that's towards. Step this. towards. Yeah. Step great. towards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in there. Another, this is a, a cultural context of the Nordic region of being a more fundamentally, the narrative of business in the Nordics is business is fundamentally about cooperation. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally about cooperation. And in the US, we've characterized it as we have a romance for competition here. Mm. And this strikes me as something that competition oftentimes can unnecessarily tee up a zero-sum game of the world mm -hmm. um, and a you know, red and tooth and claw type vision of the world. And it strikes me that you're the third story of capitalism. Is there more of a cooperative underpinning there? Or how do you see yeah. that? Um, so I, I'm a, a big fan of, of systems and institutions. I, I, I really try to think about the health of systems and institutions. Um, and to the extent that, that, obviously competition is very helpful in, in certain areas. And, and, and then um, it you know, stimulates innovation and hard work. Uh, but sometimes it, it can be destructive or it put, puts people into a, into a zero-sum mindset. Um, and so to the extent that to the extent that your institutions are working well and you're encouraging more of the positive-sum games, that's great. Now, just, a, just an example that occurs. Is, 
the extent that companies are, are, are spending a lot of time suing each other, uh, taking out patents, or, or you know, trying to make money by you know, legal arbitrage, there's all sorts of things that companies do that are not generating value. To the extent that our legal system incentivizes that, then it's a really bad system. So I do think that, um, again, effective government is essential for getting to this third story. I don't know if we can get there in any, in any other way. Um, but th it would involve thinking about human nature, thinking about how easy it is to turn us into tribalists fighting each other and destroying value, or how easy it is to turn us into people trading with each other and exchanging with each other. One of the encouraging things I see in human nature is that while we're all talking about tribalism these days um, in our politics, if you look at actual tribes, yeah, they're really good at circling around their respective you know, trees and rocks and then preparing to fight, but they're also really good at forming long distance exchange networks and exchanging goods and not services, but exchanging goods. Um, so that's in our nature too. And so to the extent that our institutions and laws bring out more the, the positive sum cooperation, you're gonna get more value creation and therefore, if it's used well, more decency as well. Can it's I, too rambling. Can I yes. raise the issue now, because I know both of you were talking about this. And so uh, in business schools, not talking much about tribalism, but a lot of discussion of stakeholderism as opposed to shareholderism or workerism or stakeholderism. And so what do you, what do you think of that? So a stakeholder view might actually start very much with the view that business is positive value add. The question is the, 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 the distribution of those benefits across multiple stakeholders. And I, I just wonder if you think that the stakeholder approach is an important way to think about this evolution of the middle version of capitalism or the yeah. 21st century version. Oh, I, no, I, think it's, I think it's crucial. I think that is the bridge. Um, what really struck me when I came to Stern, I was teaching that course the first time, where we do, you know, we, on the first day we read, as you probably do here, the Milton Friedman article, yes. the, business, you know, the social responsibility of businesses to increase profits. Right. And the students at Stern were very much they learned everywhere else at Stern that your duty, the fiduciary duty of the executive, is to maximize shareholder value. And so we're going through all these cases and all these examples, and at the end of the course, and I was just the, sort of the apprentice teacher there, you know, I, I, I looked at Bruce and the students and said, oh, I don't understand. Like, businesses are composed of all these people working really, really hard. That's right, like, their whole lives. The employees, <laughs> their whole lives. And why is it that they don't count, but the person who accidentally buys a few shares without even knowing it, why is it that they're the sacred person that we're all, I, I don't understand this. Right, right, so right. The, the shareholder model was a particular idea conveyed very powerfully in the 1970s by a couple of writers, including Milton Friedman, right. that sort of took over this, the highly systemized thinking of business school professors and the, and the economics community. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I do think that that is a bad idea, but it's a, such a clarifying and simple idea yeah. that the MBA students at Stern all, all flock right to it. Um, I can't do a poll now of how many of you believe it because I've already shown how, you know, if you believe it, you're a moron, no. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but getting the conditions under which people will think that, yeah, sometimes it makes sense for me to do things that are good for, well, the cu okay, customers are actually, business thinking is very much it's about very taking care customer. of customers. No, that, it's, that's it's, not the problem. It is very it's, customer. Yeah, it's really, it's really the employees. That's it's really the, employees. the ones that get, get, employees. get cut out. Right. So right. how do we... Right. How do we get to a culture in which businesses treat their employees well, even if it requires a very small trade-off against the shareholders? Well, it's impl it, I want to do one other one. Stakeholders can include your community. So basically, stakeholders, you've got the employees, you've got the customers, yeah, right. you've got the, the shareholders, and you've also got the community. And one of the things that it, we were talking about also is as these companies get very large and get somehow spread around the, role, the world and therefore delinked from their communities in a, in a fundamental way, then they're less likely to think through. And that's why basically lots of other governments, uh, if a US company comes someplace, they expect them to do things uh, in their communities. And okay. so these companies have all of these foundations and special programs and it's part of selling their corporate relations to a country to say I will do this X, Y, and Z for your community. Mm -hmm. While they're exiting communities in the United States, by the way, so yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. But uh, Robert, you had an interesting thing about the history of the word stakeholder. I thought this was really interesting. Yeah. A Nordic Viking, huh? Yeah, it's this. <laughs> boy, I, I, you thought you were going to be promoting your your upcoming book here on this thing, and, and it turns out I get the opportunity. So it's the word stakeholder. The first time it was ever iterated in in management literature, it, it was in Scandinavia. It was in this wonderful book, Industrial Democracy and Industrial Management. Uh, by uh, what year was 
Pardon? What year? It was 1964 in Swedish, and they used the word interessant, but then 1968 it was published in English. And then it was the dominant management book across the Nordics for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting, it, even the title of that book, Industrial Democracy, mm -hmm. how do we apply democratic principles to, in the management of organizations? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. real deep-seated, yeah. these democratic pillars in the Nordic region. I had never in my US experience in 10 years corporate America and as an MBA, encountered the word democracy. Right. And, and so this, I, I find this very yeah. interesting, and I think that this is, I think it's also part of this narrative of capitalism, given the influence, good and bad, that capitalism has on our societies, that we should be thinking about democratic principles in this. It strikes me. Yeah. 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 So uh, just as a, a, since everyone has a little personal history note here, I started economics and comparative economics, and the question that interests me was worker ownership. Yeah. It was basically the notion that, that who owns the machines and how you share the profits of machines and why didn't we have more forms of organizations where the workers actually were. And there was a very strong, that literature you're talking about of no, no, it's fiduciary. A lot of people opposed to worker capitalists and said, oh, well, you're just spreading the risk on the workers. Let's protect the workers by giving them a wage, and then all the risk will be taken on by the, those who provide the capital. Okay, so we want to protect. So it was very, it was kind of paternalistic view, of, but sounds like a post hoc rationalization to me. I, I thought so. So let me. Uh, I want to raise one other thing, and then we'll open to the uh, to the floor. And this is uh, there was a very influential uh, letter from Larry Fink. Uh, he he's the chair and CEO of BlackRock, and in January he always has a letter to his investors. And this year he took a very strong view. Uh, on the importance of corporations having social responsibility. So I'm just going to read a couple of lines. Society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. To prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but must show how it makes a positive contribution to society. Companies must benefit all of their stakeholders, including shareholders, employees, customers, and the communities in which they operate. Now, a positive, uh, this to me suggests that there is m not so much the politics here, but there are a group, and, a, and a, an increasingly large group of investors who are actually motivated by the social performance of the companies they invest in. They are choosing to be investors in companies because they have a social purpose. So is this not a way that the, the pressure of the financial markets brings us to a third version of capitalism? Uh, yes, in theory it is. Uh, I was very, I was thrilled when I read the letter when, I, when we learned about it. Um, uh, as as you, as you were saying before, companies were anchored in a community. There were normal social forces acting on the executives who had to see other people at the golf course or wherever it is that they were. I mean, there were human pressures, human pressures. To, to be a good citizen, to donate to this and that. And as companies have gotten financialized and internationalized, those pressures are off and all sorts of ways of making more money by financial chicanery become more appealing. So the BlackRock letter is basically a way of saying, we need to sort of reimpose or find a way to put on some basic conscience, some limits, some sense that you are connected to others. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. great. I'm very enthusiastic about that. I think it's entirely appropriate. It's not some corruption of capitalism. I mm -hmm. think that's all great. What worries me, though, is that in America in particular, and it's happening in other countries too, but especially here, we are so politically polarized, and the polarization is rising and rising and rising so rapidly over the mm -hmm. last, it's, it's really accelerated in the 1990s, but it's going up and even faster the last couple of years. So as soon as you say, well, business needs to see the social, serve a social purpose, and this is gonna be driven especially by young people, young employees who are much more passionate, much more politicized in every mm -hmm. activity. Um, so it's not as though, well, there's social purpose and then there's like corporate selfishness, no. There's left-wing social purpose, there's right-wing social purpose, okay. and my vision, what's the line from 1984? Imagine a boot stomping on a human face forever and ever, something like that. Is that the line from 1984? I don't remember. Is that it? <laughs> you know that? So, okay, so what's the future of corporate America? Imagine a, a group of angry young people fighting each other over, over bathrooms and every other possible political, oh, I see. Uh, I imagine see. that forever and ever. Forever and ever, using, okay, all right. So that's, I don't know that's gonna happen, I'm just saying. 
we can't just say, oh, social purpose. We all know what that is. Right. And we, we, we see now, just in the most recent uh, wave of companies coming, taking a position on guns. Mm -hmm. so, so companies feel the pressure either from their community or from their employees or from their customers or from their uh, investors uh, to basically yeah. I think take especially you know, customers and employees. I think right. are the main ones okay. that really put the pressure okay. on. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. But at the end of the day, you know, as I was saying, there are investor funds now, and BlackRock has a lot of them, where you can basically, you can put together, you can, you can define your social purpose for a company, and you can probably find a fund which has uh, put together a bunch of companies that do really well on that social purpose, okay? And uh, it, you, you, there's, there's just more and more product out there like that, and more and more investors uh, who are thinking about that. Uh, so it, it may be that over time you get more power. I think in the case of the, the, what's happened on guns, that's coming from customers and employees so far, not, not yeah. investors. But, that's right. And yeah. so to the extent that investors are saying, well, we won't invest in that. Right. So you can put that in your spreadsheet model. You can weigh up how much of an influence that has. It's tiny, but maybe yeah. it'll, right. there's that. And then there are boycotts, which is more like, let's give everybody a gun, and you point it, and, and you know, oh, there's 36 guns pointed at me from that side, and 84 from that side, right. so I guess I'm going that way. So, <laughs> I don't know, you know which social purpose. Yeah. Right, right. So we're happy to take some questions, um, because we do really want to encourage some questions. So let me see if we have any to start and, with. And please, yeah. to, the, to the microphones, if you would, and, and oh, no, as, you, as you gather the microphone, could I ask you one, yeah, one more That's question? Yeah, go ahead. That's great. Go for I, it. I'm, we have, you have wonderful students at NYU Stern. I, I know that. But I think we have even, even more wonderful students here who are, who are out in the audience. What, what advice, what guidance might you give, given these great challenges that we face, these divides between us? What, what's some yeah. advice that you may <laughs> offer? Oh, boy. Um, oh, dear. Uh, well, first, I, I, I want to uh, dispute your premise uh, about, um, <laughs> no, we have fantastic students at Stern. Um, advice. The world, that, the, the world that you're going into uh, is going to be different in a number of ways from the world that we all thought we were going to be having. Um, and I think one of the new things is going to be this incredible political divide. Um, a lot of the things that we're seeing on campuses now, so I'm very, I'm, I've been, I'm writing my, I have a book coming out in a few months called The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. It's about a lot of the things that are going on on campus. Well, the new development in the business world since last August is that all these issues on campus are, are quickly spreading into the corporate world, and it's a much more politicized, angry, contentious way of being, which is very antithetical to the normal spirit of cooperation within a company. So I would urge students to recognize that this is happening, um, to learn about moral and political psychology, and to try to be a force for calming things down. Calming things um, down. Companies need very high levels of trust and cooperation. I mean, they can function without that, but they function better and it's more fun to work for if you have very high levels of trust and cooperation. So I think we all need to learn to adapt to this hyperpolarization. You can be as active as you want politically in your life outside of your company. But my advice, my suggestion would be that we realize we have to adapt to this, and we're going to have to try to live and work with people who don't share our values. And that's going to be a new challenge for people uh, beginning basically this year and on, much more than it was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And if you'd kindly say your, your, your name and where you're coming from. Hi, um, I'm Lawrence. I live in Sweden. Um, <laughs> so perfect, uh, perfect conversation uh, topic. I think I actually asked you a question yesterday as well, your other talk. Um, so my question really is, do the motivations of business uh, matter in relation to this trend we see now with a push towards a stakeholder view of the firm, corporate social responsibility? By that I mean... You know, you could take a pessimistic view and say that this is all just a risk mitigation strategy by, by business, and they're only doing this to maintain their social license to operate. But, you know, do the motivations matter if the net effect is positive? Right. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. That's my question. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. a good, question. That's a good um, question. In my discussions with my students about CSR, um, the general consensus is that most of their companies are just going through the motions and doing it for accountability purposes, and they're not really that sincere. Um, and, um, and my view of it, as, as, which comes out of discussions with the students, is sure, you can't blame them for doing that. You can't blame them for jumping on the CSR bandwagon and doing a lot of greenwashing. In fact, 
on some no. accounts, they are obligated to greenwash if right. their competitors are greenwashing. But at the mm -hmm. same time, mm -hmm. there's a line from Hamlet, um, assume a virtue if you have it not, for use almost can change the stamp of nature. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so if companies are pretending to care thing. about right. CSR, after a few, you know, they're spending money on yeah. it, they're hiring people, exactly. they put it in all their corporate logos, and the young people they're hiring believe it. Mm -hmm. um, after a while, it actually, they actually do begin to care. And if they really go back on it, a lot of their employees and customers are going to be mad about it. So you know, we, we, we shouldn't really expect business to take moral leadership if it in any way is threatening shareholder returns. We shouldn't expect them to take lead. I mean, individual companies, yes, yeah. they do that. That's great. But, um, but it's OK with me. I think the premise of your question is that even if they're not sincere, if it, it ends up doing good, right. and, and I would right. say yes. And that, of course, was Adam Smith's point. It's not, from, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher and the baker that we expect them to serve our needs, but from their regard for their own self-interest, or we'll paraphrase. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think things are moving in the right direction for whatever reason. That's right. I mean, having, having uh, been on, on boards a long time in my life and having really had this whole process, I mean, I believe that the first uh, meeting in the White House on corporate social responsibility, even before it was a term, was Bill Clinton having, bringing in, and that time it was like Nike and the apparel, mm. uh, the apparel, the apparel producers and things like that, so, talking about sort of supply chain issues. Right. So I've been involved with the business community uh, a long time, and I, I would say that I completely agree with you. Even, even if initially it, it was pressure from the outside, pressure from the media, pressure from investors, pressure from customers, pressure to, to mitigate risk, yeah. that you do over time you ask questions differently. You actually, you actually come up actually changing your behavior because you see what you're doing through the prism of corporate social responsibility. You, you, you didn't see that. You, had, you didn't have that prism before. You didn't have those glasses on. Once you have those glasses on, you are actually going to change your behavior. Yeah. And actually, that's a great example, like the way Nike was pressured to change. That's a great example of how you make the stakeholder view become true. Mm -hmm. In other words, stakeholder theory is all about how if you're going to manage a business, you have to pay attention to five different major kinds of relationships. If right. you're not paying attention to these relationships, right. it's going to hurt you. Right. And in some industries, well, that isn't actually really true. And in some industries, <laughs> they don't really matter. And the way that they come to matter is by activists holding their feet to the fire on sweatshops or whatever it is. Right. Well, now suddenly they do matter. And now suddenly a stakeholder view is actually the profitable view. Yeah. So I think this is, when I said I'm a, a fan of sort of thinking about institutions and systems, this is what yeah, I mean. System. Like, it's a system. Yeah. To the extent that the system and the presidential leadership can help, to the extent mm -hmm. that the system makes a stakeholder view more profitable, then they take a stakeholder yeah, view. Yeah, then they take a stakeholder view. Yeah. So I think, and I love the Hamlet quote. We should all use that. That is mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, there was another question. I think over so, here. Okay, yeah. great. Yes, I'm Heidi Weller, and I work with a program in the uh, Emerging Initiatives group here. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about two things. First of all, um, the, if we backtrack on a systems level to corporate governance, and the foundation of the corporation, my understanding is that it was granted the rights and privileges because it was considered the best way to allocate resources fairly within the society and the economy. So I wondered if that might be being more rigorous around corporate governance and true to its initial purpose might be an option for systems progress. Um, and number two, on a very, very tactical level, all of the activity going on now, whether it's March for Our Lives or Black Lives Matter or um, any of the foundational work going on on the ground level, is that the fertilizer for a third form of capitalism where people are really rejecting um, systems that haven't worked for them and we have such a heterogeneous population here in the United States that there might be some common ground in those movements? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, good mm -hmm. questions. I know very little about corporate governance, so I'll, I'll leave those those questions to you. OK. Uh, what do you think about the, the second? The second point, I think, relates to yeah. very much what you just were talking about, well, the which activism, is you create, yeah. activism can create uh, attention to problems. Well, it, you know, it, no, it, it certainly can. It certainly can. Um, and to the extent that, to the extent that uh, in, a dem, in a, so we have, we have a, a free market, a capitalist democracy, um, and to the extent that there is research showing that the preferences of the people on the top tend to get translated into legislative action. The preferences in the bottom half have no correlation with what happens. So to the extent that um, our democratic system does not respond very well to the needs of many, um, then I think protests 
are, are a valuable part of the system, a valuable uh, a corrective. Uh -huh. um, and so, so, yeah, I think that is, it, I think you have to look at capitalism and democracy together. And to the extent mm -hmm. that okay. they don't fit perfectly, um, so I think, yes, your, your, your question I think is a good one, and, and the activism can certainly do that. I, I'm imagining that activism can also have some bad effects for business when it's based on incorrect facts. And one thing that's generally true about political movements and activists is that they're not very open-minded. They're not very good at nuance and subtlety. So I don't know the whole story about DDT, for example, but you know, I read a lot of libertarian, I do read some libertarian stuff. So I'm not a libertarian, but I do read a lot of libertarian stuff. And, so, and they're full of examples of well-meaning, well-intentioned right. reform efforts that did exactly the wrong right. thing. Right. And for 30 years, it had devastating effects. So I'm not, mm -hmm. I am not, I, so li like the founding fathers, I'm a big fan of saying the people have to be able to throw out, the, throw out the, the leaders if it's not working, but you do not want the people making policy. That's what the founding fathers believed, and that's what I believe. Um, so if there's a problem, people should be able to, there should be a way for them to scream. But you don't want a mass movement able to set to solve policy. To solve the Because they're probably going to get it wrong. Even the experts can't yeah. really get it right very well. So I'm going to say one thing on corporate governance, because I think the rules of corporate governance do matter. Uh, again, if we take the system that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and which is basically the, the German system, and the, uh, basically you have the supervisory board, and you have the shared corporate governance. And shared corporate governance means there is a voice for labor at the table. Yes. It's within That's the, what the Germans do well, It's I within think. the yeah. governance structure. Yeah. I like to say when I hear conversations uh, about uh, what tripartite solutions uh, say to the issue of labor market flexibility when you have automation. If you say tripartite in the United States, people just look and go, Which, what's the tri? Yeah. Who, 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 what makes up the three parts here? Yeah. So it is in, the, in those cases, the employees having a role in governance structure in some way. We, we wrote the law. Uh, in a different way, and, and frankly, I do think that business school professors and economists did a lot of damage in the period you said, the 1980s, by basically more and more defining. The whole notion is the following. Capitalism is, a is organized around the view that there is a residual claimant, that is, the supplier of the money to make this thing work bears all the risk to whether there's a return or a loss. And therefore, that residual claimant has a claim to decisions to choose managers to go after maximizing their residual claim. That's what it's all about. Uh, and nobody else has a claim. Because, so I'm just saying, we did a lot in our yeah. own profession to take that, and then with the legal profession in the United States, and hone a very tough definition of fiduciary responsibility. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Kyle. I'm a second year MBA here at Haas. Um, one of the things that was sort of an aha moment for me in your uh, book, The Righteous Mind, was the research that you'd done on essentially showing how we essentially feel forward and kind of reason back. Um, and so um, for, for me, uh, one, of the, one of the things I've been trying to think through over the, the last year or so is, you know, in an age where technology pervades our lives, a lot of the things that we, you know, see in our life are kind of curated for us based on our own emotions and desires. Um, can lead us to make decisions that maybe aren't optimal or also can lead us to crowd out voices that maybe we should engage in and should be having more productive conversations with. Um, are you optimistic that we can overcome that? And do you have any advice for people on how to sort of break that cycle of emotion leading to, uh, sorry, emotion leading to action? Yeah. So if your, your question is basically about the role of social media in changing everything about what's going on. Sure. And, you know, even beyond that. Yeah. yeah. So I'm very pessimistic about the next five or ten years because of social media. Um, the way, I mean, the way that I think about it is, you know, you have this complex system that's based on certain parameters, and it evolves over time uh, at a certain pace. This is, you know, our, our liberal democracy. And then somebody sort of reaches in and changes one of the, one of the parameters by a factor of a thousand. And that factor is, the, let's just call it the degree to which we're connected. Um, and, you know, um, I mean, you know, back in the time in the Clinton administration, he was a big fan of non-zero and mm -hmm. the idea, oh, increasing cooperation and this mm -hmm. is all going to be great. And if we can connect even more, it'll be even better. Right. And what we didn't realize right. it, sufficiently, I think, is that we are basically tribal primates designed to live in groups of 50 to 150 with frequent wars against each other. And we've evolved. <laughs> 
and we've evolved a set of liberal democratic principles of religious toleration to that allow us to live with people who are different from us. And we sort of, that took a long time to get, and there was a lot of violence along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. suddenly we're realizing, no, we're still the same ancient tribal primates that we used to be. And so the fact that we are so ready to believe the worst about the other side means that in American democracy right now, it's like we all have a giant sign on our heads saying, insert probe here, tell me something terrible about the other side, and I will believe it. Mm -hmm. And the Russians saw that and said, sure, here you go. But it wasn't, it turns out it's not, the Russians and their bots actually aren't even that big study that came out in science. The Russians and their bots aren't really that big a part of the equation. It's really, uh, you know, we've seen the enemy and it is us. So I'm very pessimistic about the effects of social media in the medium term. Mm -hmm. I think in the long run, it's going to be sort of like the way we had wars of religion for hundreds of years, and then yeah, we yeah. finally said, okay, let's just, you know, let's just live next to each other. We might eventually adapt to social media, but it's going to, it's going to take a while. And so I would urge all of you to think about how many times you forward something whose goal is to trigger outrage in someone else. Think mm. about that and cut that by 90%. Mm. If we all cut the outreach that we forwarded by 90%, we'd only be wow. three times as angry as we were 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a question over here. We probably have like one more on each side, and then because we're already over time, but go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Richard. I'm a student uh, here, and I'm, I'm from South Africa and care a lot about inequality because uh, we're the most unequal country on earth. Mm. And one of the areas where I've had the probe inserted is of this, this massive fear of wealth accumulating faster to those who already have wealth, the Piketty argument about rising right. inequality. Right. Any ideas from your side on what are the levers with how the system can be adjusted to respond to that? Oh, boy. That's um, tough. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, that's really tough. And you know, as the robots and AI are coming, it's likely yeah. to get even, even, worse. Worse. even worse. So yeah. I, I don't have much to say on that. Um, let me think if I can say anything hopeful. No, <laughs> can I, I, I really can't, I can, really can't. Can I relate it to something in your other book? Because I, I, I thought it was really important. So fairness is something, fairness is a concept which the righteous mind, of, it's a basic concept, yeah. oh, it's yeah. a basic it's a moral, moral principle, yep. okay? That both people on the right and the left yep. have. Yeah. Um, so there, there might be a sort of sense over time from people on the right and on the left that there's something unfair about this degree of inequality. They, mi they might have a common yeah, sort of important. sense that it's not fair. I I'm, I'm guess no, I'm I asking so. you. Yeah, I don't all, think so. All right, so let me get to your second point about fairness, because you talk about the difference between left and right is proportionality. That's so right. is it the notion that if, if you're worried about the also inequality, the righteous mind on the right would say, but that's just the way the market works? We don't. So, so people on the left, so everyone cares about fairness. Everyone understands proportionality in their personal lives. But on the right, that's all of fairness is proportionality. And so if somebody is generating a 1,000 times more value, they've earned a 1,000 times, times more money. More um, whereas on the left, there's both proportionality and there's equality. And it's only on the left that people say, the, you know, the rich have a 1,000 times more. That, that's not fair because it's unequal. Yeah. That only resonates on the left. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the reasons why I'm not so, well, many, many reasons I'm not optimistic is that the, the, one of the, the, the way you can resolve this inequality problem is if you have a community in which people feel a duty to each other, they feel as Scandinavians do, there but for the grace of God go I. They mm -hmm. have a sense that we are, you know, we, we've, all, we've all been through things. To, I mean, so if you have a sense of community, that can really moderate these. Okay. But if you look at the graphs of trust, which were, it, I think in the 70s, America and Scandinavian countries are actually pretty similar really? in their levels of trust oh, no. in each other oh. and in institutions, or the 60s and 70s. But then America really begins to plummet, wow. and Scandinavia doesn't. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I think that in America, and I imagine in South Africa, I imagine a very low trust in each other and in institutions. It's hard to address these problems without trust. I, mean, I would add in South Africa, we've got 50 million people, and only five, five zero, wow. and only 5 million earn enough money to pay tax. So even with all the goodwill uh. in the world, and if you had trust, uh. yeah. there's a big question of how. Of how, right. Right, so I mean, you can want to trust someone, but if you don't have recommendations on how to alter the system, yeah. you kind of learn to live with it. That's right. Once again, if you have a pathological governing system, if you don't have a good legislative, if you don't have good democracy, it's hard to do these other things as well. Mm. Both of our countries have big problems in this area. 
So last question, Saren. Hi, Dr. I'm Saren from the Center for Responsible Business. Robert, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have to come up there and, and, and shake you at it's all. It's not over yet. A um, bit of a similar question. So uh, targeting back to your original graph you had where about in the 1500s you said GDP was attributed to the onset of business and, mm -hmm. and capitalism. That's also the same time period where colonialism mm -hmm. and the slave trade and things like that were happening. Yes. <laughs> do yes. you think this at all true. business and capitalism could have developed without that? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that is kind of a necessary ingredient for the way business developed in terms of right. having to disenfranchise communities, having to build mm -hmm. off of literally free labor? Very interesting. Yeah. No, there's no question that exploiting, exploiting people uh, increased productivity. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been a number of books written about this. Um, I don't think it was necessary, and I, I haven't read the books. And read, so this is one where those the books by where, there's a Harvard guy. What are they? What are those two books on the slave know. the role of the slave trade? At any rate, the historians on the right dispute it. Um, uh, McCloskey, uh, uh, what's her name? The trans uh, McCloskey. McCloskey, yeah. McCloskey has a whole oh, dear, rebuttal dear, 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 right. rebuttal of it. Okay. I'm not mm -hmm. taking sides. I'm just saying that I think it's pretty clear that had there never been slavery. Had it just been, oh, here's a boat, let's put our money together, let's go move stuff, that would have worked, probably slower. So I don't doubt that exploitation, colonialism, and slavery accelerated the rise, but I don't see any reason to think that it was necessary or essential. But it goes back, I guess, to your point about ultimately we're all tribal. Yeah. Okay, it was basically one tribe exploiting another tribe or exploiting many yeah. tribes. And that's, that's right, and that's why, okay, so I think there has been an important evolution of capitalism, such that early capitalism was really quite brutal. And then gradually, right. Right. as money accumulates, and you look at what happened in Britain in the 19th century, mm -hmm. as you get much, mm -hmm. as you get wealth, you get a change in values to the point where the British, before anyone else, are saying slavery is wrong, child labor is wrong, mm -hmm. cruelty to animals is wrong. Mm -hmm. So the wealth that capitalism creates by brutal means ends up transforming the capitalists so that their children actually have much more progressive mm -hmm. values. Mm -hmm. And if you look at those graphs from the World Values Survey, who's at the far upper right corner? The Vikings. <laughs> All right, I'm, af I'm afraid we have to uh, end this. Uh, 